So with that though, you know, last week, again, we have this organizational planning idea. And in marketing, it happens just like many of the other areas where uh, when we start a plan, we start from a very broad perspective, right? So, um, you know, have this organizational level starts with oftentimes a mission and a purpose. And we talked a little bit about that or, or had a little bit of that content last week. Um, then we move into this idea of strategic planning or strategic marketing. And that's where a lot of really, really big key decisions are made. Uh, in marketing, when we talk about strategic planning or strategic marketing, we're often thinking about the, the brand, the branding strategy, um, brand elements, what the, what the personality is going to be of the, um, of the company, of the brand. Uh, we start to think about, in a big way, who our customer is going to be. We're going to do some, like, market segmentation, those types of things. Um, identifying profitable markets as opposed to unprofitable markets. Um, thinking about market entry strategies, those types of decisions. A lot of times in that middle section of planning, that center kind of strategic stuff, we do a lot of product portfolio work as well. When we think about products, we think about products as a collection of cash flows when you're thinking from a marketer's perspective, and when you add a product, you're adding an opportunity to put cash into the organization. But we know when we bring in a new product, it also impacts all the other products that we offer. It impacts operations. It impacts every other aspect of the organization in some cases, right? Especially if it's a brand new product to the organization. So new product development, concept testing, all of those types of things up in sort of in that middle planning period. They usually have a three to five year time horizon. Uh, when you introduce a new product, for instance, you oftentimes hope to keep that product around for a while. It's not like a quarterly decision that you're kind of making and then forgetting about. Which then moves us though into the final phase of planning, which is functional. At the functional level, we, we're planning sort of the day-to-day -day activities and key metrics that we're going to measure and monitor to ensure that our marketing plan um, is, is executed and it is functioning the way it's supposed to be. So in that functional plan, we look at like ad placement and media buys. We look at distribution channels, specifically kind of getting a product to the customer, adding value that way. Um, we Managing those channel partners that we have, things of that nature, price changes. You know, we may set price at a very, very early stage, but we also make nuanced price changes as we go, right? Um, and we kind of think about how that's going to impact demand and obviously profit margin along the way, right? So, so, so last week was a fundamentally important week from a big picture point of view. No, no doubt about that. Um, but I hope what you got away out, out of it was the kind of the planning process in marketing. I know in the chat in the book, um, we look at, um, or there, there's a little bit on the marketing plan and an outline for the marketing plan. Um, and no doubt that's a key component of a lot of what the marketing area does in terms of planning, the outcome being a marketing plan. Um, so that's good, good material to get. The, the last part of last week, which... Um, again, without kind of the, the in-person kind of interaction, uh, when we talk about plan and purpose and we talk about mission, a key concept today um, in kind of organizational, I guess, marketing or what, whatnot, is this idea of aligning your brand with the ultimate purpose that it's going to serve. Absolutely, purpose should be, I, I would suggest, uh, to um, return shareholder equity. Right to, to to make money for the owners. That that's typically in a for-profit organization going to be one of the one of the things that that we plan to do. But in today's not only culture but in the evolution of business and where we are today, the expectation of organizations, including for-profits, includes a social role or a social dynamic that simply wasn't there. 5, 10, 15 years ago, 
Um, and, you know, I, I get that it varies by culture, varies by geographic location, things like that. In some places, this is more emphasized than others. But as consumers, we know or we feel like, hey, look, is the company I'm giving my money to doing good things with it? Are they operating in a, you know, like a sustainable way, if that's important to you? Are they representing underrepresented groups of consumers or employees or society, if that's important to you, right? So there's this onus now or this obligation that firms are feeling pressure to, uh, to, to, to kind of acknowledge and then do something about from a social perspective, which then in turn Im impacts their purpose, if that makes sense. So it's like, all right, we're going to run this business, but we have to have employees. And all the employees are really focused on, you know, some type of, you know, social impact, then the employees make the business. The employees are the DNA and the culture of the organization. So that would be reflected in its purpose. And that's sort of the kind of idea. Now, take that from a consumer's perspective. If, we're, if, if, we, have, if we need customers, and if the customers are demanding that we behave in a certain way, we can either do it or not, or, or position ourselves in a way that either attracts, or attracts customers or repels customers. If you repel a customer, in this sense, it's called customer alienation. And I don't know if you've ever felt this way. Maybe you're a loyal customer to a brand or to a company, and then they do something that you don't agree with, and you, all of a sudden you feel, that brand's not for me. That brand doesn't represent me anymore. It doesn't like reflect me or my purpose. And if you feel that way, then you will feel alienated or disengaged from that brand you were otherwise a part of. We sometimes call this brand community. When you're part of a brand's community, you're part of their culture and who they are and so forth. So, um, so, so this is like a bigger conversation today than simply the, let's call it a mission statement and move on. It actually has some impact. And we can all think of examples where there have been brands that have either purposefully picked a political hot topic and pursued a position on that hot topic. And they've either, you know, you know, been rewarded by customer loyalty or been slammed by customer revolts. And we're seeing more and more and more of that to, to some degree. Um, I think companies, I hope, are beginning to be a little bit more um, strategic about how they do, do some of this stuff, but sometimes not. And sometimes you see, that, see these things happen. So la that was last week, though. All right, so I don't want to dwell on last week uh, just because we got to move on, right? So this is week three. Already, we, there are only 60 days in the semester. So this is week three. Amazing. Um, do you all have any questions about last week? Or were, you know, any comments? Is there a brand? Is there something a brand, is there something so bad a brand would do? That, are there any brands you've, you've uh, revolted against? And we'll, we'll talk about, maybe not. Yeah. You look at the bad light when they did a, uh... Advertisement with a trend girl and everybody thinks gay beer now. They, they switch. Big, big. So Bud Light, um, I, I've actually been doing a little bit of research, and I don't have the data at all 100%. But yeah, I mean, they lost um, billions of dollars or since March or April, right? Lots and lots of market share. Um, big question. Are they going to, can they, and how long will it take for them to regain market share regain their brand, their brand image, and all of that. Um, was that a mistake? There were a lot of folks who front and center were saying Nike was making a big mistake by, um, by signing Kaepernick as their spokesperson for their 30th, and I think it was their 30th annual Just Do It campaign, you know, um, called Kaepernick. And, and, and the initial reaction had some negative impact on sales, negative impact on market share, negative impact on, on some supply chain relationships. 
But within a fairly short period of time, the positive reactions far outweighed the negative reactions financially, from a financial perspective, uh, of that campaign. Now, will, will Bud Light experience that same bounce back? I don't know. We'll see. There are a whole lot of alienated customers and, you know, uh, that feel abandoned. They feel like the brand has left them. They feel like the brand has, you know, it's not for them anymore. Modelo now has the number one market share in the U.S. as opposed to Bud Light. If you have ever seen a Modelo, anyone seen a Modelo ad? Modelo TV ad, yeah, yeah, most, most people. Modelo ads are macho, strong, imaged, they're a tough person, you know, they're, 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 they're the, the opposite of the um, messaging that Bud Light perhaps has sent. So it's kind of this, this, this kind of real kind of in the marketplace, this comparison. You see these two brands repositioning themselves to some degree. Uh, Modelo, to their credit, I think in this case, whether they meant to or not, has been competitively strategic in how they've gained their market share. Um, and we'll see how the rest unfolds, right? Uh, of course. So anyways, um, so let's move on. Let's talk about chapter, uh, this week's chapter. Welcome to class, obviously. Um, we're going to move forward, think about some strategic things. So chapter three is kind of, this, this week's chapter material deals with analyzing the environment in which you do business or the situation in which you do business. Um, so part of that early planning process includes something called an environmental analysis or situational analysis. And that's largely what the material from today talks about. Um, oh, as an aside, I know last week you probably read the Patagonia piece. That's all about cost marketing. That's all about that, that whole piece. It's good. It's worth, even though we didn't discuss it, it's worth going back and looking at it to get a chance to visit their purpose. But with that said, um, we're kind of moving forward with this idea of, um, of a situation and the context in which we find ourselves. So when we think about um, kind of where we are, the text has this illustration. It's not a bad one. Uh, when we review and kind of take a snapshot of where we are and kind of the whole context of business. In the middle there, you're going to see internal this internal situation or internal element. We're going to come back to that um, here in another two weeks, week five. We're actually going to talk a lot about something called resource advantage theory. We're going to talk a lot about the uh, strategic competitive advantages a company can have and those types of things. Okay, but as we go out, you know, from this internal element of analysis, you're going to who we are. Right? Um, customers. Right? Who's buying our product? Who do we interface with? And you know, again, kind of think about we're going to expand this a little bit. First week we had an exchange where we had firms and a customer and they come together. So it's not unusual to see elements of the company, the internal components of who we are, interacting directly with the customer. Okay, that's that's fine. We can do that. Then if we move a little further out. The picture depicts this idea that there are these external forces, and I like to call them sort of the macro environment. I'm not the only one. The macro environment are these external components that we largely don't have a lot of control over, but they serve, if you do a SWOT analysis, as opportunities and threats, right? So these are kind of these large impact concepts, and again, if you do a business plan, you're going to do a SWOT analysis. You're going to do an environmental analysis of things like the political, you know, kind of kind of arena, the environment, social, sociocultural elements, technology changes, and so on and so forth. The one element up there in the big picture, kind of the environmental forces, you're probably going to spend a special bit of emphasis on would be the competitors. 
So there are all these other things out there in that kind of lightly blue shaded area, uh, but there, there are competitors too. And I would argue that you probably want to spend a little bit more focus or effort on them when you get an opportunity to. And we'll talk about that here in another framework in just a second. Okay, so through this, we're going to look through through this this idea, these ideas a little bit, and I want to frame them, frame tonight's conversation with um, a structure that's not directly from your textbook, but it is, I want to say, fairly common or intuitive. I'd say it's called the product market space. Okay, product market space. So, uh, product markets are spaces or markets or uh, kind of concepts where customers and firms come together. A market's formed, and that intersection happens. So if you'll remember two weeks ago when we did exchange theory, the middle of the exchange, the middle of the model, there was a big circle. Remember that? There was a big circle in the middle, and that's where the marketplace is, where these exchanges happen. So think about that big space in the middle and how that space is organized, like in, in, like in practice. Okay, that's, that's a product market space. All right, so product markets then provide the structure, sorry, I don't want to read off of those things, but provide the structure that matches people's needs with the benefits um, that they have that, that can be that met, met those best, excuse me. Product markets exist, you know, kind of like we thought of with that exchange when customers with similar needs come together and there are firms that have products that can also meet those needs. Now, keep in mind, two weeks ago when we looked at that exchange, I mentioned this idea that it's not one customer and one firm, even though they do come together and make an exchange, the marketplace is made up of lots of customers and lots of firms' value propositions. So when we add this multiple of, you know, more, it adds complexity, and that's where the structure really starts to unfold a little bit. So we need buyers who have needs, and we have products that also can come in to meet those needs. Remember also just from a kind of a, a, a de definitional type of a thing, when I say market, I mean a group of consumers that have the same unmet need or want. When I talk about industry, I talk about firms that satisfy that singular need or want. Okay, so that's just a definitional thing. So product markets, where people come together, it's a structure of these things that, that we're looking at. I did a video again, and it had some of the content that's shown on this screen. If you saw the video, you might recall this image. Um, where we start at a period of time, this is the kind of like the beverage, you know, this is a naive, maybe simplified illustration of the beverage industry. And looking back in time, um, you know, maybe in a commercial market where you had certainly probably coffees and teas, right? You had milk, you had, you know, water, things like that back back early in the early days. And then, then we have soft drinks and, and maybe elixirs, things like that. This is not an alcoholic. Um, and somewhere along the line, some crafty uh, food uh, scientist came up with Kool-Aid. Thank you for Kool-Aid. Uh, right, I mean, everybody's a staple of lots of diets. Kool-Aid comes along. Um, and then we kind of go through time and the category expands. The category grows by definition in terms of what products are brought into that space. Now, it's important to think about markets as they evolve. And this is like, starts as a pretty simple like beverage, not alcohol, beverage market, right? And you, you're a consumer back in the 20s and 30s and Kool-Aid's not around yet. You go to the market and there's only so much there, right? So many offerings. And so that's there. Kool-Aid comes along and now you have another choice. So in that space to satisfy that generic need of non-alcoholic beverage, fast forward a few more years and we have some more additions to the product category, right? Uh, mineral water, 
fruit drinks, sports drinks. Um, I distinctly remember, I know I'm aging, but I distinctly remember, you know, having water being sold in the store, bottled water. Like, like for the first time, we had Perrier and things like that. Thinking, how silly is it? Nobody, nobody will ever buy bottled water. You can just get it from the tap, right? I mean, how silly of a product is this? But of course, it's what we all, right? We all have bottled water. But you can think of it as a kind of an expansion of the product category of the space that offers consumers ways to satisfy this generic need. Fast forward again, and we have energy drinks and sports drinks and so on and so forth. Now, why is this important? You know, there are a lot of different reasons. One, each time there's like a category shift like this, it redefines that product, that, that product market space. It redefines, A, the firms that will compete in that space and who your competitors are. And it redefines what the consumers view as acceptable products that might be both substitutes or even direct competitors to your product, right? So if you miss this, then you miss it. And you know, one of the concepts that, 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 that is kind of overarching here is this, this idea, I know you may be familiar with the term myopia. Myopia meaning that you have tunnel vision and you only see what's in front of you. So back in 1960, a very important article was written and, and entitled Marketing Myopia. And the whole article was kind of devoted to this idea that the quickest way to go out of business is to have too narrow of a focus or a vision on your product market. You know, this is one of these ideas where, look, if you're Coca-Cola in 1890s, 1900s, 1920s, if you're Coca-Cola and you don't recognize that Kool-Aid is a potential like can cannibal to your product, then you're in trouble, especially fast forward with water, fruit drinks, right? So, uh, and sports drinks. You know, if you're, if you're Coca-Cola and you define yourself as a soft drink company, moreover, if you're Coca-Cola and you define yourself as a cola beverage company, and that's it, where would you be today? Right? I mean, if you say, well, I'm, I don't do Sprite. I don't do, you know, these other weird flavored fruity uh, soft drinks. We're a cola company. We wouldn't do that. You know, as the evolution of the product market space changes, then if you don't also recognize that change, um, then you may be in diff difficult difficulty, right? Um, obviously, Coca-Cola, I use that example because you know they own and have controlling interests in what, Dasani, right? A water company, and Minute Maid, and food beverage company, and Powerade, a sports drink company. Right, and, and, and they've certainly expanded from being a cola company to multiple other soft drinks, flavors and such. Right, I mean, had they not, would they be in business today? That's the question at the end of the day. That's what that article really talked about, uh, again, back in the 60s uh, when, it was, when it was introduced. And kind of this idea that part of marketing strategy and kind of the world, you know, the, the, the kind of the management of who, you know, of what we do focuses on evolving competitive environments um, and customer, you know, shifting customer needs and interests. And that's something, you know, that's kind of what we want to focus on and kind of illustrate here, here if, we, um, if we can a little bit. Okay, so product markets product market spaces. There's uh, a couple different steps to take as we look at kind of kind of this. We'll walk through these tonight. Um, and these, these kind of go along a little bit with the material from the text, so, so we'll introduce some of that as well. We want to talk about 
pencil makers, and we want to talk about Harley Davidson if we can as well. So hopefully you had a little bit of an opportunity to look at some of that material, but determining the boundaries and structure of the product market, analyzing the product market, uh, there's, a, there's a tool you can use to do that, we'll look at. Uh, thinking about customers, thinking about competition, all right? Now, these last two pieces, um, we see those again and again and again in marketing. Um, so this isn't the only time that we analyze customers. It's certainly not the only time we analyze competition. Um, so, you know, it'll sound like a broken record if I say, let's do a customer profile. Um, you know, that's just one of those things that, that we do a lot of. Okay, do you all have any questions? You good so far? We're rolling right along, right? All right, good. We're on board. We like this product market thing. All right, good. Um, all right, so determining product market structure. I also want to kind of highlight this idea of product market boundaries a little bit. We'll show a couple of illustrations of that. Okay, so basically the idea is if we were to define the needs of a market, what we want to do first and foremost is define them in a very generic way. Of, in, in the most generic way we possibly could. Um, maybe if we use that, that drink kind of, kind of concept, you know, people who are thirsty, they need something to drink. That happened to be in the non-alcoholic beverage space. Yeah, that's a pretty generic need. I'm, I need a non-alcoholic beverage, and there's a million different offerings out there. If you define that space and kind of think about who the customer is, probably... In many, many cases, that's going to be too broad for us to really focus, right? I mean, most people don't say, well, I'm just a generic uh, non-alcoholic beverage company. Usually, we focus a little bit more on kind of a specific need or a specific technology or something that we offer the marketplace. So as you think about the structure of a product market, start generic, define what that generic market is, and then... Build out the market with specificity, getting narrower and narrower, more focused and more focused into, into what we think of as probably niches, right, or, or specialties, if you will. So product categories will be something that we'll look at or types of products within a generic need or space. And then we'll look at um, specific products and variants or variations of products within a product category. Okay, so some illustrations. Let's look at just some illustrations on this, and we'll and we'll kind of get the picture, I think, of, of what's what's shaping up here. So yeah, we have this generic product space, right? Beverages, okay. I'm a beverage company. That's pretty broad. Okay, well, I'm either kind of we've got this definition now. I've defined this space, this product market, as having either alcohol or not. So couple different paths to go in, right? So again, I'm just kind of defining my space, defining what's out there. Um, each level or each branch here would, would actually also define a slightly different market segment too. People in the market segment who are buying alcoholic beverages are different from people who are in the market segment buying non-alcoholic uh, beverages. Now, there may be some overlap. You may have people buy both. Right, but they're two different two different groups of consumers, and so we have two different types of products. Right, if you can define consumers as separate and different, then we're probably in a different space. Right, take it another level down. Right, take it another level down. So we have sort of these product type ideas, and we have these variants out there, and kind of how you define this might be up to you a little bit. We might add more or add others. Um, and this is kind of very much like what you just saw in that last chart or graph, right? Showing all the different ways we could satisfy the non-alcoholic beverage market, right? Again, each one of these ovals represents, though, a potential different market segment. People who are buying juice may very well not be buying water. They're buying it for a different reason. Or some people are buying water and they won't buy juice, or soda, or things like that, soft drinks, coffee, tea, and all like that. 
Then we take it a little bit further. So fruits, that would be fruity soft drinks, root beer, ginger ale. And obviously there's more probably. I just kind of wanted you to get the idea. And then within a specific kind of variant, once you get down there, you ultimately find yourself competing against individual brands. All right, so this is kind of one of the depictions of product market structures. Now, where you work or where you may work, potential, if you're on a job market or future job market opportunities that are out there, you should be able to create something that looks like a product market space for that company, for that business. Now, this is, this is one of these things as a, as a business manager, you should know and understand where the opportunities are out there in the product market space. Now, keep in mind, again, if you define your business as something at one of these lower levels, you run into this myopia issue. It's where this kind of comes back. Again, if I define myself as a cola company, then I don't see root beer and ginger ale as a threat, necessarily. Although it is, right? They are, right? I don't, if I define myself as a soft drink company, then what happens in the, in the 90s and the thousands when sports and energy drinks come along? And I'm like, what? No, why would I want to get into that? I'm a soft drink beverage, I'm a beverage, soft drink company. Or you kind of lose this perspective, this narrow-minded thinking sometimes if you don't see the big picture. Now, maybe you are a soft drink company and you're not going to be a sports drink company. And that's okay as long as you know that and you can define yourself and you can clearly, you know, carve out of your space. You can, you know, I mean, if you own the market, if you have a lot of loyal customers, if you have a lot of distinctive capabilities, I mean, you stand out and you are here. I mean, Dr. Pepper has done pretty well. I don't know. Dr. Pepper's probably with somebody else. Keurig. Yeah, Dr. Pepper was with Keurig, who was bought by Green Mountain Coffee. I don't know if they're still together anymore. I've got a buddy who's, an opera who's the operations manager at Green Mountain Coffee, and so they had to deal with some issues there. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but, but so that is kind of this idea of the power of the product market concept, okay? That's, that's where, that's ultimately kind of where I want you to think, you know, when we start thinking about, about where we are right here um, with, with this in particular. I'm going to work on, so, so I want to do one other sort of illustration, um, and I'm going to use the sideboard over here so I can say hopefully this will work well I don't know um, we'll, we'll try to do this so uh, again uh, there, there's another way to kind of look at this and I want to emphasize the idea you know that that illustration you saw I just saw a bunch of arrows and kind of this this downward thing and um, let me just paint a different picture because because this could be helpful too Let's do another illustration, and in this case, I just kind of thought about um, footwear, and in particular, um, athletic footwear, all right? Um, so, I'm going to draw a, I don't know the best way to do this, I'm going to draw, I guess I'll do it over here, we go old circle, is that coming out okay? Oh, that's pretty cool. What's that? <laughs> you know, and it's funny because my art ability ends at stick figures. So clearly not, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> all right, we can do a little space. Okay, so running shoes. All right, that that's kind of one product, right? In this footwear, this is athletic, kind of sports athletic footwear. Okay. Think about Nike or Adidas or Reebok or whoever, right? Okay, so that's one component of this space. Think about this whole space, this whole circle as the 
universe of consumers who are going to participate in this market for athletic footwear. And runners make up some of those, right? And so we're going to kind of carve out um, a little bit of space for, for those folks. Okay? Um, perfect. All right. And we're only going to do a few here. There, obviously, there are going to be lots, right? But for what we're doing, we're only going to do a few for some illustrations. We have people who walk. I don't know if you can see that, walkers, right? Absolutely, we have walkers out there. They want comfortable shoes as well, and no problem. So we have, we, we kind of have their, their space here as well. We have cross They do all kinds of sports, right? Um, this could cut across a lot of different athletic or sports or even casual um, athletic, you know, kind of interests, right? So we have, so we have a lot of those. And the last little category I'm going to put is golf. I don't know if there are any golfers here. Golf. Now, golf is kind of a specific niche, wouldn't you say? I mean, when you look at sheer numbers, it's just not a large large portion of the footwear, athletic footwear industry. You know, proportionately, it's just not huge. Um, and if you buy golf footwear, I mean, you're probably golfing. You're not usually running in golf footwear. That would be terrible. You know, and you're probably not doing other things with it, right? It's sport-specific for the most part. I mean, I guess it's depending. Now, okay, so... Think about these markets and think about this space and sort of think about these lines that have been drawn that define these, spa these spaces. Um, there's a couple things to kind of take away or think about, think about here. One idea is these boundaries are, and I'm going to call them blurry. Okay, and by blurry, I mean sometimes it's hard to know exactly where that boundary is. It's kind of wishy-washy. It moves around a little bit. Um, so if I define a walker as a walker and a runner, sometimes they're both. Sometimes they're, you know, it's hard to define one or the other. Now, I can easily and pretty clearly define a runner as different from a golfer, probably. And you'll notice that they're sort of away from each other. But wherever you have a boundary in a product market space, there's oftentimes a little fuzziness in how we define them and where exactly that boundary is. Um, okay, so this is kind of one thing to think about. And this is a spatial idea um, that, 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 we, that we look at. Another thing that we'll do is boundaries, they, they shift over time. And they move. So popularity of golf is going to may grow, right? If the popularity of golf grows, then it could grow into uh, some of these spaces here, or it could expand the whole circle as well, right? So you can take, take customers from other product categories or the whole circle might grow. A couple different ways, ways this can go. But these lines shift lines move over time. They don't stay static. Okay, that's another reason why, again, if you're a product manager or you're like working for a company that has one product line and you're not like conscientious, like looking at these other trends going on in other product categories, you may see erosion of your, your sales and market share and such to some, to another product, something like that, right? Likewise, if you're that company that does running shoes or cross trainers, it may not be that hard for you to create a golf shoe and add that to your product portfolio if you see that there's positive, you know, positive movement in that shift from one space to another. So they shrink, they grow, and they 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 they, they shrink as well. Um, okay, um, just like lines are blurry, um, markets overlap. Like, so, as I've kind of mentioned, there is overlapping that happens. It's, I don't know if it's rare, probably rare, that
that the boundaries are mutually exclusive. When we do segmentation, one of the rules we like to say is that consumers are in mutually exclusive groups, meaning that if they're in one, they're not in another. And so from a market segmentation perspective, when we're trying to define a market, um, when we go to advertise, we want to try to advertise one message to one group of consumers. It gets messy if we try to use the same messaging for multiple groups. So that's why in, in segmenting marketing, we try to say, if you're a walker, you're a walker. You're not a runner. But in reality, we know that's not true. Right? So there's overlap across these, these boundary lines. Um, the last thing that I'll say is, well, I don't know, this, I guess it goes here. Um, we can overlap, and I only have red. I don't know how to change the color on this board. Uh, I'll figure that out maybe for next week. But we can over, over, we can over, superimpose on this. We can super, oh, wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I will, what color? We'll try this. Um, <laughs> It's really not competition, it's just market offers. We can super, the second, the other thing that we can do, we start thinking about this, is we can put in these spaces the products that are available to satisfy this market space. And sometimes you'll have things that do like this. So the blue dots are products by us and by our competitors that satisfy the market space, so it's superimposed um, here. And, and so you, you sometimes get these weird like combinations kind of like that, where we have a lot of crossover and things like that. If you see in this running area, you notice I'm putting a lot of dots, there's a lot of options for consumers there. If there's only a few in here, it starts to look like a perceptual map in the way that you interpret it, there aren't very many options for the golfer in this day and age, and so in this map, and so maybe there's some opportunities to satisfy that, that need. Uh, right, so, all right. Example, another, another way to think about, or another illustration of the product market structure and where those boundary lines are. It's a bit theoretical and esoteric. I get, I get that. But if you can picture it, you can imagine. You can imagine where these customers are going to come from. You can imagine like what it means if you're trying to reach one group and you're selling a product for, that's poised and suited for a different group. Or you can also imagine as a manager, if you're selling a product in one space and you don't see these other products, you know, kind of categories becoming important, how it could impede your your ultimate your ultimate objective and, and progress, right? All right, questions. Does this make a little sense? Are we okay? You okay so far? Yeah. Product markets. All right, good. Good, 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 good. All right. Analyzing the product market. All right, so here's a tool that we're going to look at. It's, and there's not, it's not a fancy name. I haven't ever found a fancy name for it other than the product market grid. Okay, we're going to dig deep into a little bit of marketing here. You're going to remember some of the things we talk about now. Um, as, as things you've learned in the past, all right? So the product market grid is a managerial tool that, that we're going we're gonna to lean on a little bit. Um, and it's primarily based on products that are offered to the market and markets that we serve, okay? And this product market grid, again, it's a managerial tool. You could use this tool. I, I would, um, especially if I wanted to understand like how a business operates and kind of the space that it operates in. All right, so just plain and simple, I'll throw, throw out just kind of a generic kind of makeup of the, of the product market grid. We'll look at one illustration and then we're going to move on from there. Okay, so on one dimension, we list products, all right, to make up this grid. This is not complicated. On the other dimension, we list out the market segments that are served in this product category. Now, think of the category tool, all right? And also, 
feel free to think of this as a tool that you could use for the entire product category, not just your company. So when we say products are on that, that, that top dimension there, those columns, it, it, you know, P1, 2, 3, those could be my products or those could be competitors' products. Those can be like all the products that are in a specific product market space. Okay? And when I look at those markets, again, we can define those markets in lots of different ways, but they're customers that, that are being, you know, that are offered. So, so here, you know, we, we, you know, we had this, this, this image over here. I don't know why I'm walking over here, but we had this image over here. Um, you know, we might have walking shoes. We may have um, uh, running shoes. We may have golf shoes. Um, we may have cross trainers or something like that. Those might be the types of products we have. And they're serving different markets, runners, walkers, and so on and so forth, right? Okay, so this is the basis of the product market group. Now, if we're doing this specifically for our company, you know, we can. We can, we can create this chart, if you will, for our company, for our organization. And we can lay out all our products, and we can identify who we're trying to reach with those products. Not a bad idea to do that. Um, here's an example of Reebok, right? So this is an old example, and the reason why it's old is because I haven't found a newer one for anybody. Um, so I've used it for a long time. Um, but it's really illustrative of this idea of picturing, you know, kind of from a managerial tool perspective, the offerings that are in the marketplace and the markets that are being served. So here we have a series of different products. We have running shoes, aerobic shoes, tennis shoes, basketball shoes, kid shoes, walking shoes, cross training shoes, golf shoes, and their S. Carter shoe brand. And now, again, this is old, right? This is super aged. But it's, the age doesn't matter. It's the point that we can identify how the market's being served broadly speaking, and what markets within that product category are benefiting. So if I say, okay, look, I've got this running shoe. Who benefits from this running shoe? Well, runners do, primarily, right? But who else does? Well, remember that, remember that overlap? Yeah, not only runners, but there are other folks who are going to maybe buy in that product space as well. Right, so so that's so that's how that's illustrated there. I purposely chose cross trainers because all kinds of folks will use cross trainers. It's not just this one real small product category space. It's this big one with a lot of potential customers. Probably going to have a lot of potential competitors as well. But you know, it's it, it's big. It's big for us, right? A lot of people are going to buy this product or have use of buying this product. Golfers, I'm sorry, there just aren't very many of you, and when we produce that shoe, it's really sport-specific. It's just not something that would easily be transferable to other, other needs or other, other consumer markets. So golf shoes, we have, we have our golfers. Now, you know, you look at this, and again, please know that you can do this for an industry. You know, you can get as detailed and specific or as vague as you want, but you don't have to, I mean, this is Reebok, but we could do, you know, Nike, we could do uh, Under Armour, you know, all the others that are out there, Adidas, and we could sort of do a composite here to analyze a product market space, um, you know, kind of expanding this, this idea. And it's a tool because it's usable, which is actually kind of cool. All right, because look, what, what, Two space, just looking at that, is overused or over over overcommitted. Yeah, like like the walkers, they have two primary shoes available to them and four four alternate shoes that they could use. Would we really need to create another shoe dedicated for walkers? I mean, you know, I mean logic would say that's probably they're probably covered, right? Now maybe not, we can do some analysis. Maybe it's a super big, growing market segment. Maybe there's lots of opportunity there. Maybe they love our brand. Maybe our brand is known to them as the brand for walking. 
So maybe we want to capitalize and be the shared leader in that particular you know, space. Uh, but things right now, like, I don't know about that. Street fashion, though, on the other hand, or adventure seekers, what about an adventure seeker? You know, the adventure seekers don't have anything dedicated to them except for the cross trainer, but that's for everybody. What if we did an extreme sport shoe of some type? Something that was you know, dedicated to the various extreme sport enthusiasts out there, right? That, that would capture you know, this type of consumer and there's nothing else out there for them really to buy, you know, at least from Reebok's perspective. Does that make sense? So look at, so, so as a manager, you know, we're examining the product market space. That's what we're doing. We looked at the boundaries. Now we're looking at the product market space itself. Who's in it? Who's being served? How well are they being served? And are there opportunities for us to serve them better? Right now, this is like real strategy when you start thinking about, you know, like where can we grow? How can we do our, you know, markets? You know, how can we define this market as a leader? What role will we play? Right? And that's a, those, those are big questions that we want to ask. So in marketing, there are some growth strategies. And again, these, I, 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 I always come back to these every once in a while, you know. You'll remember some of these if you remember marketing probably marketing growth strategies. Um, this is actually derived from the Ansoft growth matrix. I don't know if that would ring a bell to anybody. Uh, but basically the idea is we, we have these strategies to, to grow sales and grow revenue, cash flows, one of which is a market development strategy. Um, and so basically the idea is, I'm going to go back for just a second, if we added a new type of consumer, if we defined a new type of market that maybe wasn't defined before, um, maybe it is something around the, you know, extreme sport space or, or something like that. Um, if we defined new markets and then sought to, sought to, you know, try to attract them, that would be called a market development strategy, something that we do in marketing those defined strategies that we use. But importantly, or in our application here, if you take that, that product market grid, it serves to expand the chart. It pushes the chart vertically up and down, right? I mean, it, it expands it, right? It makes that product market space bigger. All right, second thing, or another thing that we can do is a product development strategy, right? That's probably something you've heard of before, yeah. What information am I using to populate a, a grid like Reeboks? How am I deciding which populations are using which shoes? So that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of market research that you'll do internally to know um, kind of like who's buying what products. So certainly, certainly this chart here, this is a chart that Reebok could create, would create, Based on their customers who are buying the customers who are buying their products, like they, they look at customer sales. They will do research. They will have a defined profile that's been created for each one of these types of customers. If that makes sense. So, in other words, they know the demographics, the psychographics, the buying behavior, the attitudes of walkers. And they'll, they'll group them together as a group of consumers and say, these are walkers. They meet these criteria. This is how we define them, right? And then they'll, sit, they'll take that type of person, that type of consumer, and they'll focus products towards them. They'll design products towards them and things like that. The, now, it gets a bit more complicated as you start looking at other companies. If you're Reebok and you want to analyze Nike or whatever, there, there are lots of research companies that do that all the time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a pretty common thing to do an industry analysis type of a thing. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so 
we could add products to better serve the markets we already serve. Remember that golf market, Reebok has one shoe, we could add another one that focuses on them. The Adventure Seeker, we could add more shoes because that is an underserved um, you know, market probably. The last, the last strategy, uh, again, going back to kind of marketing ideas is called a diversification strategy. All right. And again, with each of these three strategies, the size and shape and scope of that product market grid changes. It adapts. It grows. All right. and theoretically, it could shrink if products were taken away or if markets were uh, exhausted or if they, they, they left, I suppose. Um, typically, we don't associate deletion strategies with growth, but so it's okay. Um, so, so the, this third strategy then is di called diversification. And these strategies, again, the ANSOF growth uh, strategy matrix kind of is, is what you would see in a textbook or, or somewhere that would refer to these. Uh, does anybody know what the fourth one is that, we haven't, that I haven't mentioned? Does anybody remember the fourth one? There's one more. It's boring, so that's why. Yes, do you have it? All right, it's the, it's the penetration growth strategy. It's boring because the, the chart doesn't change. All right, and to, just to be complete, that's why I mention it because it's part of the four growth strategies marketers use, but it doesn't impact the product market grid at all. It just sits there. Um, and basically the idea, if you don't know what a penetration growth strategy is, the idea is you take the products that you have and the markets that you currently serve, and you look for what's called consumer surplus. You look for opportunities to upsell those consumers and to get them, the consumers that are buying your product, for them to pay more and buy more and spend more money with you. So it's a strategy of growth where you get existing customers to, to spend more money with you um, without adding new products. Okay, good, yeah. All right, so that's so this is kind of a good start. How are we doing? Are we how far over am I? Oh, we're okay. We're, we're gonna we're gonna be fine. All right, so let's talk a little bit. We're gonna shift gears a little bit, right? All right. Pencil markers look sharp. All right. Can you look at this this little article a little bit? Pencil marker, pencil makers. Yeah, pencil makers look sharp. So. All right, what is going on with this? So, so what, what, is, what is the product market space that we're talking about in this, in this article? I apologize, it's so small. I don't know if yours is small, but mine is small. What, what's the product market space? Writing utensils. Writing utensils. Okay, excellent. So from a generic, the generic, you know, kind of definition of your writing utensils. Fantastic. How can we take it a level low, net, the next level now, you know, split this product market space up from writing utensils? What are a couple different ways we could go? Wooden pencils. Wouldn't that be old good, good, good the, the old tried and true Ticonderoga number twos, right? That, boy, that kid. Brought back memories there. Okay, so wooden pencils. What else? What's another writing utensil type? Pens. Pens. Markers. Mar oh, markers. Excellent. Like digital writing utensils. Excellent. Digital. It's mentioned there. Crayons. Crayons. Crayola crayon. Those when you say like art utensils. Oh, fantastic. Brushes or other utensils, pastels or like that. I love it. Okay. All right. Good. So we have kind of this idea of where we are in the scope. Is this a new technology? No, not really, but it has some twists, right? Kind of like Encyclopedia Britannica a few weeks ago, right? When we talked about kind of it's not a book, but it's this it's like a digital age thing. Right now, this article too was written a while ago. 2014 or so, or something like that. Uh, yeah, 2014. I, didn't, I should have it. It's a, 
Wall Street Journal article. Um, uh, okay, all right. So what do you think about this idea then of 2014 of d digital writing defenses? Does anybody here, who here has a, some type of a digital stylus or digital writing defense? One? Anybody else? Those pens that have the rubber tip, so like you can use it on your phone. Kind of like, kind of like the, the yeah, yeah. Well, just those that you click and then you know what I'm talking about. That it's like a touch screen thing. Yeah. Think, yeah. And then it works on your. You need the device though right. to do it, right? Yeah. 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 Um. Count the Anton Wolfgang von Faber Pastel, chief executive company. Of Faber Castell is quoted as saying that penless offices and schools is wishful thinking. It won't, it hasn't happened. Agree. You agree. You agree. Why will, and let's just say, let's, let's put words in his mouth say it won't happen. Will it, will, will we always have a need for? Try the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so, but, but I'm, so a couple things here. One is, um, and I'm actually going to, I, I've got to, I'm going to, I'm going to move this along like this. What one thing to just kind of think about here is, uh, again, when we talk about products, we talk about markets. Um, it's not hard to also in the same conversation, talk about something called a product life cycle. So, uh, oh, we're still on Zoom. Oh. oh, boy. That's awful. Product life cycle. Many of you may be familiar with this. We'll just kind of look at it real quick. Um, where we have sales, this is typically in a industry, like, or a, a big product category. We draw the product life cycle. And then down here, we have time. Um, and so, again, this may be something you're very familiar with. Back in time, we have the development process where we develop product ideas, we develop a product, we launch the product, and then sales, if the product succeeds, sort of take off, right? And then, and then over time, they sort of plateau during the maturity stage. And then eventually, sales begin to um, typically decline. Um, and you know, not all products follow the same pattern. Not all products, uh, you know, take off as quickly as others, some take off faster, um, some take uh, some plateau for a very long time. Some products uh, go out of business right away and they never get into this. Where do you think pencils are on this chart? Like where where along this line would pencils be? I think it's on the decline. Okay. All right. So let me let me just do this real quick. Let me I almost have this figured out. We're getting there. So the decline would be somewhere over here, and you're saying somewhere in the decline. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to put it in X just for a spot. Does everybody agree that pencils are in the decline stage of the product life cycle? And I don't think you're wrong. Maybe other answers too. What do you think? Yeah. Um, what do you I mean, think? It's, it's, people still use it. It's not on the decline stage. Okay. <clears throat> there are many electronic options also. When a kid starts going to school, there are electronic options. Actually, okay. So, that's. Uh, okay. I'm talking about in like developing nations, how they're using a lot of like traditional pencils. All right. I like that. 
you buy a digital one, you usually have them more than two years all the time, but if you buy a pencil, you keep buying more pencils. And then usually one day you buy another one. So by the fact that the pencil wears out and, and, and you use it, you have to buy another one. Yeah, and I also think that's, like, okay. that's what marketers love, by the way. Yeah, and I'll tell you guys, people use still pencils more than here. And I think the article was talking about Asia and how it's growing. We did a race of Asia and Perfect. All right. So, so while it may be in the decline stage, it may also be, you know, kind of in the, you know, I don't know, this type of maybe the growth stage, maybe not, maybe, this is fun, I'm going to do this more often, it's kind of like a game, this is maturity stage kind of in the middle there, something like something like that. So talk life cycle, digital stylus. <coughs> um, Faber Castell, do you see what percentage of sales of revenue come from pencils? Or one third. Maybe no, I'm looking one, at the, yeah. the percentage of sales that come from developing. Yeah, no, but you're right, one third. Okay, so a thirty third so third of your sales come from pencils. I mean, as a business manager, is that a that's a pretty sizable portion of your overall revenue? I would say. And if you define your product kind of in this way, you know, depending on where you see yourself on the product life cycle, it could be very scary if your product that brings in thirty three percent of your revenue is in the decline stage, or somewhat optimistic if 33% of your revenue comes from the growth stage, right? Something along those lines. But I think you're I think you're 100% right. And just to kind of give some, some perspective here, um, if, you, if, if you remember uh, global pen, global pen and pencil sales are expected to be what four percent this at the time of the article there's the global sales growth four uh, percent for pencils and four point oh I got that right oh it's four point nine actually for pens that's global now is four percent growth rate decent Our finance friends. Our finance friends like 4% rate of return of growth rate. Or take into account inflation. Sorry, talk about it. Take into account inflation as well. I don't think this does. I don't know if it mentioned it, but I can't remember it mentioning it. Maybe it does, but good point. Yeah, right. Okay, so again, 33% comes from what is projected to be a 4% rate of growth over over this next year but here's the thing in let me do this again <laughs> uh, we'll go with crimson this time countries oh sorry did that in developing countries in Asia the same growth rate is supposed to be 5.4%, and Latin America is supposed to be 7%. Which is right, it kind of depends on where you are, right? It kind of depends on, and one of the takeaways this week is this idea of the environment in which you do business. And kind of one of the one of the ideas of this article in particular is that we've got this interesting product that I, I, I know pencils may not seem interesting, but it's a big market, especially in growing and developing economies. Right? The growth rate, you know, all of a sudden a seven or eight percent growth rate seems a whole lot more attractive than a four percent growth rate, right? And 
if you're focusing your business model on those developing economies, then you have a path forward probably. And that's kind of what's going on here, more, more than likely, right? Um, so, um, so the last thing, you know, kind of leave with this is, you know, we've got this, this, this situation. It's like this, the analysis of the business situation. Um, we've got a, what would appear to be a dying product category. Um, but where you're doing business kind of matters. The economy, the political structure, all of those types of things, those macro forces. Um, did you pick up on what or where the growth is for developed economies? Steady or rising? Do you see what the products are that are being sold or pushed in those spaces? Higher end things. Excellent. Excellent. So the fancy high end pens and pencils. So now we say, well, look, you've got different product categories, you've got different product markets. We've got a product market that has a traditional pencil, right? And the growth rate is, um, you know, you know, the prices are going to stay stay low, but you know, our, our margins are probably going to be similar. But the number of units we're going to sell will be higher. We go to a developed economies. We go to the U.S. or Western Europe, and instead of selling that same pencil, what we're going to do is sell a fancy pencil and pen, and we're going to raise the price. It'll be an exclusive type of a product. We're still selling a pencil or a pen. Mean we're jacking the price up, right? So our profit margins. We don't have to sell as many units, but that's okay because there aren't as many units. To, there aren't as many customers to sell to, right? Growth rate stagnant in those economies, so it's not like we're going to make money by selling more units. Where we're going to make money is by charging more money, or in essence, a pencil or a pen. It'll be a fancy pencil or pen. But that's how we're going to make margin. That's how we're going to make money in those spaces. Well, it's kind of an interesting. So this little article has a lot of interesting little pieces to it, doesn't it? It's kind of a little thing. All right. Um, any questions or any comments? So with like doing like fancy pencils, I feel like the target group might change. So how can they still make sure that they kind of make the revenue they want to? So with the fancy pencils yes. and pens? I mean, it's not like, it's like, you know, like a normal pencil, you can like sell it to everybody, but like a fancy pencil, I don't think like people in school would necessarily use a fancy pen. It's probably more like business people, so. It's a perfect example. I'm glad you asked that, because it's a perfect example of how we define that market segment. Well, while they are under that generic category of consumers who use pencils, we would, we would place them in a special market segment of their own. You know, people who use pencils, but they're willing to pay and they want to pay for this exclusive brand, for instance. And, um, and that would be their own. So we would have a special marketing plan. We would create a profile. We would create an entire program for them. And that's going to be vastly different from the other consumers who are in these other economies or in these other market spaces. So I wouldn't sell that same fancy pen to the school kid, even if they lived in the same household. It'd be two separate consumers, right? Even if they lived together. Uh, so it'd be kind of like what you have done like this? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. We have two different types of buyers. Um, they're buying from the same company. They're buying the same, you know, in some cases with cross-platform uh, production, you know, we've got the same components that are going into both cars, but different price tags, different consumers. Yeah. Well, technically, like, like a mechanical pencil, like, if um, someone in the area is just using, like, a wooden pencil, a mechanical pencil could kind of be kind of fancy to somebody, 
And I feel like, like for like school people in school now in uh, in Europe, uh, I feel like that's more popular now. Like I'm looking around and nobody has like a number two pencil. Everybody has like a mechanical pencil or like a pen. And then I feel like the profits with the mechanical pencils is like you can make money off of uh, people trying to buy back the lead because you you end up like using uh, the lead and the pencil. So I feel like that's a way you can make money too. There could definitely be multiple ways to define that market uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and selling ancillary products in addition to the actual pencil real Gillette model. Oh, they asked that. Okay. How does it go, Mark? Well. Yeah. It's uh, I I remember uh, my kind of journey through education. Every step was eye-opening and daunting the first couple of weeks. It's uh, always took me some adjustments. So hopefully, hopefully you guys are cruising right along, right? All right, <clears throat> let's, um, let's, let's make a little bit more progress and we'll see where we are. Uh, we'll try to, try to be manageable here about another hour or so, right? Uh, something like that. So, again, product market space, I'm kind of using that as a framework to talk about the material in this chapter and what we're, you know, kind of, again, remember that first image where we had internal kind of situation, and then we had customers, and then we had external situation, one of which was, was the uh, competitor kind of analysis. So, again, using the framework of product market kind of, kind of ideas and theories, Two more steps are involved. One is looking at the customer and thinking about how the customer's interests and changes and interests and patterns and such evolve, and then finally looking at competitors. So we'll look at these kind of briefly. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time um, kind, of, kind, of, kind of going through these too much, but um, certainly, certainly as we think about the customer, we, we want to um, kind of understand who our customer is, who, who our current customer is, and who our potential customers may be as we move forward. Um, again, just kind of put your mind back on some of those uh, product market structures where you look at who your customers are, and then if those customers shift, are you nimble and capable of shifting as well? Um, one topic that not only impacts the rest of the firm, but especially impacts marketing, is the ability to be nimble, and the ability to change and shift and move, right? Um, so, uh, you, you know, recognizing that they might get up, we went to start with, is that okay? You're good. Uh, right, so, 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 think, so keeping, keeping that in mind, um, not only the prevailing current needs of potential customers, like who could we serve next, who could be there, um, you know, that, 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 you know, that whose needs could we satisfy, how could we do that. We bring to the market a value proposition, uh, and being able to manage and change that value proposition is a reflection oftentimes of, of, that, of, that, um, of the customer, the customer need. Understanding our competitors' customers' perceptions um, and kind of what the customers of our competitors are thinking as well and how customers view them in the marketplace. We're not in a vacuum. We offer in the product market space our value, our product, but it's only relative to other offerings in the marketplace. Um, so thinking that, that from the uh, customer's perspective, and then also analyzing, kind of considering the future. Um, if you can't anticipate what the future needs will be of the customer base, then you could be that much further ahead of your competitors and, and seek to serve, serve your customers well. The textbook uses this 5W model, which is perfectly fine to do. 
uh, when you're evaluating customers. So when you think about this 5W thing, um, who are our current and potential customers? Kind of focus on that as a concept. Uh, be able to, again, perhaps do market research or just kind of look at your internal records, understand um, who's buying your product, um, and who you're not serving well or underserving, who could potentially be your, your customers. When we look at that product market grid concept, there are gaps in the grid. Those gaps may indicate underserved markets who we could serve better, right? So that's like that managerial tool to help you sort of develop strategy, right? It's a strategy development tool uh, in and of itself. Uh, what do our customers do with our products? How do they use them? It's a good question to kind of ask and think about. Um, you know, we may, we may think we understand their purpose and rationale for buying our product and how it's being used, when it's being used, the rate in which the product is being used or service. Um, but we need to know that. We need to know those things. Where do customers buy our product or products, <clears throat> you know, kind of physically, but also kind of with their process for buying? Sometimes it's something we ask, so where do they buy? Where place-wise can we intersect the customer? When do they buy our products? Five W's. Right? Last one is why. Um, or if you want to, how. If you want to shift that a little bit, uh, a little bit. But what is their purpose and what is their motivation? Why do they buy our products or buy products in this product category? Now, you can also, while you're thinking about this idea of the customer and these five W's, ask those same questions of customers relative to our competitors. Why do they buy our competitors' products? Where do they buy our competitors' products? When do they buy our competitors' products? And so on and so forth. So when you think about doing an analysis of the customer, we want to get a room full and vibrant and robust picture of them, kind of their motivations, who they are, why they're doing what they're doing. And my, keep in mind that that concept of the customer will be redefined every time you look at a different group of customers. So that customer who's going to buy that $40 mechanical pencil you know, or $100 mechanical pencil or whatever is expensive nowadays, I don't know, probably $500 mechanical pencil, that customer has its own unique profile that we could ask these questions about. And the profile of the, 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 the elementary age child who's also even in the same household, that child's profile as a market segment is going to be completely different. Right? It's going to be a completely different user. So they'll be you know, buying the product, intersecting with the product differently. Maybe that child, maybe for the kid who's in elementary school, maybe they don't come in contact with the product like at a store or through like internet sales. They probably come in contact at the school. Maybe we need to get the product at the school and then the school gets it to the actual user. You know, so like how we define that customer going to vary by customer group, by market segment, and so on. Um, this is such a popular concept that we create something called the customer profile. Um, and, and again, this is one of those tools we use all over the place. So when we do market segmentation, at the end of market segmentation, it ends with creating a customer profile. When we do advertising and we do a media campaign, we take the customer profile and we build the campaign around the profile of the customer, right? Uh, when we think about, again, uh, distribution strategy, we go back to the customer profile. So this idea of you know, kind of creating a narrative, creating a story, um, creating an image, if you will, of a typical purchaser within a market segment, very common, very, very, very uh, typical, something that we, we very often do. Um, so again, 
be familiar with or just be comfortable with this idea that down the road we'll see you know, kind of customer profiles emerge more and more and more. And we'll actually develop this idea after segmentation because the customer profile can include um, humanistic characteristics like you know demographics, age, and income levels, and education levels, and gender identities, and things like that. But it also includes neural patterns, how that customer behaves is in their profile, um, their socioeconomic status, and the way they make decisions is in that customer profile. Um, their outlook on life, their lifestyle, their attitudes, their uh, opinions, their thoughts, those are all part of the customer profile as well. So there's actually, you know, if you do a full customer profile, it can actually be very, very uh, detailed. Um, but think about the way we, like, do business today. Com companies thrive on how much they know their customer. I mean, with all the big data we have nowadays, you know, companies today live on the specificity of how well they know each customer. So, you know, it's not uncommon to have deep, deep uh, algorithms that are going to predict customer behavior that all start with a customer profile of some type. Um, so, bear that, bear that in mind. All right, any questions? We're good? Good so far? All right. Analyzing competition. Uh, this, la this last little space that we're going to look at. Um, so, so with the text and kind of we'll talk about when we start looking at, at competition, um, there's actually a reading, um, I will post readings that may be supplemental, not necessary, but helpful every once in a while, and there's a book chapter, um, it's either Ackers or Lehman uh, or Weiner's, um, on competitive analysis, which is actually a really good book chapter. I think it's on Moodle, um, but uh, but starting you know kind of at an industry level, understanding the competitive landscape of the industry, industry size, its growth, its competition, composition. Um, when we think of industries, you might industry analysis, you might think of um, market concentration. I don't know if that's a term or something that you're familiar with or have heard before. Um, Okay, so when we talk about market concentration in marketing, we look at market share. Well, not just in marketing, but we look at market share. And there's something like called the Herfindale Index um, or a three or four firm concentration ratio where you take the top firms in the industry, you, took, you take their market share, you kind of put them together and you say, well, look, how concentrated is the power among these co these companies, like in some industries, two or three companies control seventy or eighty percent of the market. You might call that like an oligopoly, right? Something along those lines. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have dozens of firms, and these firms may all have I don't know five, four, three, you know, percent market share, and that'd be an extremely competitive industry. And it's at the other end where market concentration is spread out across lots of companies. And so that's kind of one of the things we look at, at least initially when we start looking at competition. At the industry level, we think about kind of the concentration of the industry. They have barriers of entry here, also barriers to exit. That's another consideration um, when we think about kind of the dynamic of the industry's competitive landscape. Um, uh, you know, I mean, barriers to entry, uh, you know, we want to create those to control that flow of new, new threats that are going to be, that are going to be there coming our way. Um, but other things we might look at at the industry would include industry norms, standards, and benchmarks. Uh, like, how do people in this, how do firms in this industry typically make decisions? You know, kind of like, in, in some cases, we have benchmarks on how much we typically spend in marketing by this industry standard. Something That's something that would be good to know if you're analyzing competition um, in this space. New technologies, 
um, and technological disruptions that uh, could, could create either opportunities or threats within the industry itself. Yet, when we're viewing kind of that external component, remember this is like a macro environment issue. That's one of the things this chapter is all about. Um, within your industry, you or maybe a competitor or maybe somebody else, maybe a third party even, who's servicing your industry, they might create a new technology that gets put into products that are going to impact you or a new process that is being utilized by your competitors, which makes them more efficient, something along those lines. Um, then other issues you can think about, other structural changes, you know, we worry about consumer markets, you know, shrinking and growing and all of that. Well, same thing happens on the industry side too. You know, companies merge, companies become acquired, oops, sorry, companies become acquired. Um, Industries go through periods of consolidation where, you know, one company buys another company, gains market share, becomes more powerful, threatens other companies within the industry. Uh, what, what is the dynamic of that, that the industry you're in, right, of your competitors? And so when we're looking at the product market, absolutely consider at the industry level these shifts and these changes. Beyond that, Let's look specifically at our at our competitors and say, well, look, I I'm in business. Um, I have customers. If my customers went away from me, who would they go to? Who would they buy from? You know, who do we potentially lose our market share to? And that next company down the road is probably going to be one of your direct competitors. So it would stand to reason that you would want to know a lot about those competitors, right? I mean, when you're in a, when, when you're in a, I don't know, a, a battle or an athletic event, you want to know who your competitor is. You want to know what their strengths are. You want to know what their weaknesses are. You want to know how you can score more than they can score, right, if it's a game or something like that. Uh, generally speaking, if there's direct competition, that's a good thing to, to think about. So, step one, identify and understand who, who those competitors are. Uh, we'll look at a couple illustrations where we typically start with direct competitors, then we look at indirect competitors, and then substitutes, and so on. Um, so identify who, who those, those competitors might be. Be able to do some... Uh, research, some analysis to understand the characteristics um, and the features of those of those of those competitors, um, and you could actually create again a profile. Only this time, not of your market segments, but of who your competitors are, and kind of think about who who you're battling for market share with, who, who these folks are. Um, you know, understand their capacities for growth. Understand where their sales are coming from. Um, you know, you can get onto their. You know, you can, you can do research and find out what their you know, strategic plans are. In many many cases, there's a whole industry on. I'm not going to say corporate espionage, but at some point, there's a whole lot of folks out there gathering information on your competitors, and so you can you can access that. Um, we want to, like we will do later, again in Chapter 5, assess the internal strengths of ourselves, but we also want to assess the strengths and weaknesses of our competitors. So like a key to competition is this idea that we leverage things we do well. We, we have these abilities that we do well, and if... Those abilities are unique to us, or if we can do them better than anybody else, then we leverage those to gain market share and sales and so forth, competitive position. Well, here's the question. What is it that my competitors do well? What is it that they have that a customer will buy their product and they won't buy mine? Right? What, what makes them different? So, so just like we would do this for ourselves, we need to do this for them. Think about a reverse SWOT. 
a SWOT analysis of them as opposed to SWOT analysis for us featuring the S and W of SWOT, strengths and weaknesses. All right, capabilities. All right, capabilities, I'd like uh, to focus a little bit on um, a couple things. One, operational capability. Um, so like capacity, um, if, they're in, if we're in a production industry, I want to know what their production capacities are. Um, I also want to know things like their, uh, the relationship they have with suppliers and distributors because that speaks to their ability to expand and scale and some things like that. Um, so understanding that those relationships that they have are super important. Later on in the term, we'll do a bit on um, channels and supply chain. And you know, at the end of the day, if you have a strong relationship with a supplier, then you can leverage that strong relationship and you could uh, exclude other um, competitors from that supply. Apple does that with Sapphire, for instance. It's a material they 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 manage, they control like 80 or 90 percent of the world's sapphire supply. Apple, the phone company, because they use sapphire in their screens. So they've gobbled up, they've created a a, a monopolistic you know kind of environment for sapphire. And so if you're another company you want to use sapphire, the supply is limited, right? So 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 then so that's like a so that would be a good thing to know if you're if you kind of have a competitor or something like that. And the last thing I love, and because it's all strategy, um, if I do something, if I engage in a plan and I execute it. What will the reaction of my competitors be? Or, short of me doing nothing, what are my competitors planning on doing? What are they going to do? Like, so how will they respond? You know, what if the what if what, you know what if there are global supply chain issues? How's my competitor going to react to that? And what are they going to do? Um, how can I use that as sort of a preemptive? you know, form of strategy to think about how I will react. Um, and there's a little bit of like game theory thrown in here. I don't know if there are any economists, game theory economists, you know, thrown thrown in there where there's a probability that like, okay, if this happens, the probability my competitor will raise their price is 80%. And that will impact demand. So what will I do if they raise their price? Will I keep my same? Will I also raise my price? What will I do? Right, so you can play these like scenarios of these games and kind of think through. It's like it's like a thought game that, as a manager, you can think about relative to your. Right, you're like playing chess, right? And your competitors are over there. They're playing chess, and they move one of their knights or a pawn or something, right? Anticipating that I'm going to do this. Well, what you know? What's the best move to make? Um, what's interesting further about that idea in particular is that if you look at the DNA of a company or an organization, it's, it, it is predicted through and it's a projection of who leads the company. So if the leaders in the company are very risk-loving, they'll take a lot of risks. And you can predict that. If they're very risk averse, just by watching their behavior, knowing who they are, you know, understanding and studying those those man, that managerial team, if they're very risk averse, then you will know that in times of like turbulence, they'll be very conservative in their decision making process, and they will be perhaps slow to move as opposed to fast to move, right? And so that's something that you can predictively assume um, if you really know that characteristic of you know kind of who you're dealing with. Plus, couple with that, with if you watch the behaviors of your competitors over time, they'll repeat the same behavior over and over and over again, right? So that's kind of a cool thing to think about too. And one of the one of the triggers here that will you'll think about moving forward 
is um, if you see a chief officer move from one company to another, that's often a big signal that will indicate the new strategy of the, of the next company. I forgot the name, and I'm going to go blank here, but the a person who was one of the um, initiators of the Apple Store concept, right? Apple? Apple Store? Are you familiar with the Apple Store? Open, you know, like, and Apple? Very different retail environment, right? Very different from what you would normally expect. I mean, it's Apple. So the person who imagined that concept left Apple and went to JCPenney years ago, before JCPenney went out of business, basically. And the idea was this person would reimagine JCPenney, and they would institute kind of all this new retail change in JCPenney. Well, it didn't happen. Right? It was, there was too much entrenchment at JCPenney. They weren't going to change. They, he couldn't replicate the Apple retail model in JCPenney. We're going to have all these departments. Each department would be kind of this Apple experience like only in a JCPenney. It didn't, it didn't really pan out, right, granted. But the whole point of the story is that the personality of the manager, you know, was going to transfer into this new organization, and that would drive the strategy of the new organization. Now, as a bystander, sitting on the sidelines, you pick up the newspaper and says, oh, so-and-so is moving to JCPenney to lead their retail revamp. That's what they're going to do. That's, that's, you know, that's, you can imagine, you can predict what's going to happen because that person has a history which will be repeated. Does that make sense? So this is actually a really fun space to be in. I mean, if you do corporate intelligence, it's just, it's just an interesting uh, place to be. Um, again, that, that PDF there, uh, analyzing your competition, has lots and lots and lots of different suggestions on how to, how to kind of think about, think about getting information and stuff like that. All right? Um, Again, kind of this idea of who is your competition. You know, if you are here, you know, you're going to have brand by brand by brand direct competitors. Um, those who are further away from you in this product market space will be, well, less direct is about the best way I can suggest, right? Um, we could have uh, indirect competitors. So, you know, all, all of these indirect competitors but then we can also have substitutes. So yeah, I don't really feel like a carbonated beverage today. Um, I'm gonna have fruit juice. Now fruit juice and sodas, while they're beverages, they're not in the same product category. You wouldn't think of them as the same product category, but they could easily substitute for each other. Does that make sense? All right, so who am I most concerned about? Well, probably direct competitors. Now, but if I only have these blinders on and that's all I think about, then I'm not going to really maybe even see pressure and issues from these indirect competitors, and I'm certainly not going to see issues and problems that arise from, from substitutes. That article I mentioned, Marketing Myopia, one of the key kind of the remember, memorable anecdotes that's discussed is the idea of the train industry um, through the 19th, 20th century, how the train industry, the rail industry, has gone and went into significant decline. It used to be the way to travel. It used to be the way to travel. And, um, you know, for one reason or another, the train industry in the U.S. did not wrap itself around and unify itself with a strategy to... Um, to, to, to take address or take into account automobiles. Then it didn't address and take into account the impact of airplanes as transporters, as forms of transportation. Um, and it just kind of lost itself. It just thought, well, we're trains. That's what we do. We're trains. We're, we do rail. 
There's nothing else that does what we do. There's nothing else that does what we do. How about the famous last words, right? Yeah, obviously. Um, so, 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 so that's where those blinders come in. All right, the textbook again kind of reiterates this idea of um, brand brand competitors, right? Product competitors, and then these substitute or generic competitors as well. Um, this last one here, where it says total budget. Um, competitors. I, I mentioned this briefly because this kind of repeats the same concept of like closeness to you and kind of who should you address first. Um, but when we talk about something called share of wallet, that may be a term you've heard or maybe not before. Um, when we look at a product, sometimes what we'll do is we'll take a consumer and say, look, how much does that consumer spend in the product category? And in that product category, how much do they spend with us? And that's share, that's, that's share of wallet. So the example I'll usually use is something like, like the grocery store space, where you know if you spend $200 a month on groceries, think about where you spend that money. Um, Whole Foods gets some of it. Um, Aldi gets some of it. Publix gets some of it. Walmart gets some of it. You know, wherever you shop, these places get a little bit of that, of, of that product category money that you've budgeted. And so if you look at what percentage of those dollars go to you, that's your, that's your share of wallet. Okay, and that's kind of what, what we the total budget that your competitors compete for in limited financial resources in the same same customer. So, so the text uses this phraseology. I don't know that it specifically mentions share of wallet, but that's actually a metric that we might measure and we might use to, to um, track how effective we are. We are. Okay, cool. All right, one last illustration of this, of this concept again. Just pictures here to solidify this notion. If you're in the middle, you're a direct competitor. Um, in this case, this is just an example of our, our colas. And then if you're out a little bit further, you're an indirect competitor. Finally, you might be a substitute. This chart here actually explains it one other way and, or one further way to say, look, um, you, you may actually get a, a candy bar instead of a, a, a soda. If you did that, that'd be like way outside. Right? We're probably not going to be too worried about budget for food and entertainment, but you get the idea, right? Good? You get the idea. All right. Excellent. All right. So what we're looking for, when we do this competitive profile, when we look at them, we've talked about the, these ideas of you know, their capabilities and their core competencies and things like that as well. Just to run them down uh, and, and make sure we're cool with this, you know, know your competitor's scope and their objective. Just like we have our objectives, our mission, our purpose, that's something that we should understand from our competitors as well. Remember this idea of understanding their managerial capabilities. Um, if you know the people who run the business, you will know the business at the end of the day. And I can't stress that enough that companies are run by people. People have very predictable behaviors in terms of how they operate themselves. See how they've operated before, see where they've been before, see what universities and schools they've got their education from, see who they've collaborated with before, and you will understand how they're gonna make their future, future decisions. It just, it, it is. Um, going back to that product grid, the, our product market grid, look at your company, your competition's positions in the market, look at what their products are, look at the things that they've put out and who they're trying to attract, their customers in particular, think of who their customers are. Um, we looked at a product market grid for Reebok. I mentioned also you want to do this for your competitors as well. You'll learn more about your competitors by doing that than a lot of other things you do. Their marketing strategy, their positioning strategy. Um, again, I mentioned this idea of their capabilities to produce product, um, their ability to expand. I mean, if you know 
your competitors are cash strapped, isn't that the time to, to maybe lower your price, put a little bit more pressure on them? They're forced to lower their price, their profit margins got to decline. Yours will too, but they're already cash strapped. They're worried about cash flow. They got less coming in, more bills going out. That's a recipe for winning, right? I mean, that's, that's good. That's what we want to be able to do. Um, and then finally, there are key competitive advantages. Um, again, kind of this idea of we do well versus what, what we, we could also do. So what are their distinctive capabilities? Now, where do we go to get this information? Right? Well, we got to do some research. We've got to find some sources out there. Uh, there's certainly plenty of public reports, right? Uh, if a company's publicly traded, you know, you can find things out there. You're not going to gain a competitive advantage by knowing what's in the public, but you can learn a lot about your competitors and kind of what they're doing. Anything public like promotional materials, things like that. Um, tests, test markets. If a competitor tests a new product, they might do that in the public. If they're testing a new product, you can get a good idea of the things that they're, they're trying to do. Um, not listed here, but patent applications of your competitors. Uh, that's a good thing to look at. You can get an idea of what they're trying to do their R&D around if you look at their patent applications, uh, those, type, those types of things. Um, building permits, those are great to look at uh, in terms of things that you might learn. Salesforce, customers, um, absolutely interviewing. If you, if you identify employees who just left the business, and they're not violating an NDA or a disclosure agreement of some type, then by all means, why wouldn't you talk to them? Right? You would talk to your employee, former employees of your competitors, I think, to learn more about your competitor. Right? No, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. Um, trade shows, employment ads, also, I'm going to put down here, research so lots of there are lots of agencies out there, there are companies out there that will create competitive profiles for you. All right, questions. How are we doing? Doing okay? Doing good? Fired up. I'm here. All right. Um, so so where are we? How are we doing in here? We're gonna reserve some time. Uh, we'll talk about Harley Davidson real quick and then we want to wrap up. This class ends at 8.45. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. We'll, we'll see if we can get it under there. Um, Harley Davidson, one thing we do want to do before we leave, we, we have um, a group project in this class. And so um, I posted some information about that earlier, but I'd like to just kind of walk through a little bit of that before we leave. Okay. Um, so, Harley Davidson. Now, this is an interesting deal because there's, there's actually dozens of little articles, and and when, you know, when you're, when you're faced with, with like dozens of articles, it sort of tells a story when you put them all together. Um, and these articles continue to tell a story even today. Um, and uh, you know, I know there were a few there. There are certainly others that you can look up, and this. Story begins in about 2010 or so, and it goes through five or six years or so, and then and then, and then down here. Um, but if we look at Harley Davidson, I, I want to put them and the stories kind of you read about in the context of some of the things we've learned tonight um, or we've talked about tonight. And first and foremost, you know. When you read those articles, did you come away with some challenges that is facing that brand? And what are some of those challenges that you read, that you found? Like the images, like the bikers are made for old like dudes, not like women or younger people. Excellent. Okay, so a brand image type of a question. That's the, I don't have that in there. So that's, so like brand image. 
fall under somewhere. Um, it could be in there. Um, we might be able to put it in some other places too. What else? What's another kind of issue they're dealing with? Maybe, oh, maybe the shift towards um, people wanting motorcycles for transportation and not for like entertainment. So like more sleek versus the loud, traditionally. Sleek thought. versus loud. You know, you can yeah. still get around with a loud bike. Yeah. It doesn't hurt getting around. Yeah, but the lightweight, like, yeah. I, I'm glad you mentioned that. So there's this idea of hedonic versus utilitarian purpose, uh, especially in, in uh, when we look at customers and market segments. Sometimes we actually group customers. Some customers like the look, some people like the function. But, you know, it shifts back and forth, right? There's a little bit of, there's a little bit of that that goes around. Um, so customer, um, Function versus, say, style, something like that. They're expensive, but they're not innovative. So they were saying that the customers would much rather buy like a second-hand motorcycle for five or six thousand than spend it on a new one. Okay. Because there's nothing new with the new one except that it's like 2023. Okay. Good. So there's a couple. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, there's a couple things you've been covered in there too. Um, so, where would we where would we put this in the macro environment? So, one of the issues that plagues any company, only a few exceptions, but one of the issues that plagues companies is if their product never dies. If it never, you know, if you don't can't replace the product, then you got to keep finding new customers. Obviously, right. Now, this is a very interesting industry because of the very strong secondary market. Um, and this is sort of a macro issue that ha happens, I, I think, in the product category as, as a whole. Um, but I'm going to just put sort of the life of the product. And um, the second market. As something that's something that's new. All right. Um, and you mentioned this idea of lack of innovation. We'll get to that. All right. What else? You mentioned pricing issues, like people tend to buy used motorcycles. So that's another thing that you mentioned. It's a, it is another issue. They've got some perceived price issues or questions, anyways. Um, this particular brand, it's. Compared to other brands, it's, it's on the higher end. Um, it's certainly not the highest, but it's among the higher end type, types of things. I'm not sure where we put this here. So we have low price options. We have um, high priced bikes, things like that. I think this is actually going to roll up under image potentially, but I thought it was an interesting problem that the brand was so strong that there was almost, it was hard for me to think of any possibilities without totally alienating like your actual consumers today. So the image is in conflict. Uh, there, there's, oh wow, there's this conflict that's sort of that's sort of happening, and but with the customers, it's kind of this love hate thing, and that's sort of a dual issue that's going on. The reason why Harley Davidsons are so expensive is because of its brand equity and value, because they can charge a lot. They charge a lot because they can. Harley Davidson has fifty percent of their market share to motorcycles. They are the Goliath of motorcycles, period. There's no close to them in terms of market share. They can do what they want to do because their brand is so strong. But that's their problem, isn't it? I mean, that is in part part of their issue. 
There's something in, in business and in marketing and consumer called aging out. When your market ages out, it means that literally your customers out age or outgrow or grow old and there's nobody else to buy that product anymore, right? Because there's not like this, the, 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 the age out. Old Spice, Old Spice was aging out. Old Spice, before their most recent ad campaign for the last 10 years, was a dead, old, tired, boring product. Brand was, I mean, you could not resuscitate it. PBR, before five or six years ago, when the Trendsters, hipsters started it, right? Dead product. I mean, in the early 2000s, their, their market share went, oh, I have the data, but I can't remember it. Dead product, aging out. Nobody wants that old, stale beer, right? But what about today? So there are lots of examples of this, but this is exactly kind of their, this, this conflict of brand image that's happening is a big deal for them. What else? What other issues are they dealing with? Any other big issues you can think of? Okay, so cool. So let's look at some of these. The life of the product, the secondary market. You know, when we look at, look at this, the secondary market issue is a big one. It's not, that's not a small issue to discount. Um, uh, you know, you may know with, with automobiles, with cars, with motorcycles, with vehicles like this, you have uh, new car sales, and you have used, or, or new sales, and you have used sales, right? Um, and um, producers want to sell new cars because they're producing cars. I mean, Ford produces a new Ford. They're, they're glad that there's used ones out there, but they'd rather see those used ones go away and people buy new ones, right? I mean, they just came off the assembly line. It doesn't help Ford, particularly if you buy a used car, they want you to buy a new one, right? Same, same thing here, right? They want you to buy, and we need to, we need to sell the units that are coming off the, off the assembly line, not the ones sitting on the lot. So there are dealer incentives and there are opportunities at the dealer level for people to buy new car, new vehicles, new motorcycles and whatnot. At the dealer level though, no, 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 no. I'm selling product, I'm selling vehicles and you know what? There's a hell of a lot more in a used vehicle than there is a new one. I make boatloads of money when I sell a used vehicle. Or, or, or motorcycle, because I, I, got, I got the used product for a deal, now I'm selling it for a deal, I'm making money on both ends, probably, right? There's huge, more, I mean, I'm making tons more money new vehicle when my markup's so small, I'm only making a couple hundred bucks, where I'm gonna make thousands doing the other thing. So, so there's like this conflict of interest for, or this, there's this, it's kind, of, it's kind of like a principal agent issue where, where the motives of the dealer are not the same as the motives of the manufacturer. They're in conflict with each other. So that's kind of the big issue. Coupled with the idea that, especially in the motorcycle product market space, motorcycles don't decline in value as quickly as a lot of other products. They certainly don't decline in performance as quickly these other products either. You have a, you're going to have this product 20, 30, 40 years and run perfectly fine. There's not much that can go wrong with it unless you do something wrong to it. So it can continue to serve you and serve you well as a consumer for many decades. And so it's, its value is, is upheld, right? Its value is there. So, so that's kind of, there, there's some interesting things there with the secondary market going on uh, that it's a distribution problem, it's a market problem, um, and a whole lot, of, whole lot of other things. Talked a little bit about this image and this high price um, and how they kind of go together. When we brand, this term brand, it, it, it's kind of like this, again, it's a little bit this esoteric thing. It's what the, 
what the, what the product or company stands for, what it means. When you think of it, what do you think of? You can throw in brand personality, you can throw in image, you can throw in a lot of things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a couple different ways we measure it from an economic or a performance perspective. One of those ways is called a price premium. Price premiums are the price somebody's willing to pay above and beyond the generic product. So if I took one motorcycle that had no name on it, and I took another one that said Harley Davidson, and I asked customers, how much would you pay for one, no name, how much would you pay for this other one, Harley Davidson? I, I asked them what they would be willing to pay, and I looked at the difference between the two. The difference between the two is called the price premium. The reason why they can charge a premium is because the brand demands it. Now, their brand didn't just happen. The company was established, what, in 1903? Something like that. And they kind of known for, you know, the mechanical essence of the vehicle. They don't break down, they're rugged, they're tough. They have a very distinctive noise because of the valve sequencing and it's all kind of unique to them. Some people call it loud. Uh, you know, others they'll call it cool. Okay, that's fine. Um, but it's part of their image, and it goes into this high price. I mean, do they need to charge that much? I mean, is there, is there really, is their cost structure so much different than any other bike company out there? I doubt it. I don't know. Is Wisconsin expensive to live in? I don't think it's any more expensive than anywhere else, so it's probably not that. I think they charge the price because people pay it. How about that? Uh, maybe maybe that's, that's the deal. Now, no doubt, low price. They also have smaller bikes, right? Um, and they have different styles, these competitors. Style, styles. Style, I'm not going to write, right? Um, so if you want a street bike, you'll be really, really hard pressed to find a Harley that's going to suit your needs. You know, if you want a Ninja, you go buy a Ninja. You don't buy a Harley. Right? That's basically the way it is. Um, now this kind of alludes to this last point we'll talk about, that I'll just expand on, and this shifting market interest. So in the articles. What, who, who are some demographics that are, that are emerging as like a possible new demographic that they could reach or are wanting to run? Women and younger people? Women and younger people. Women and younger people. Yep, absolutely. Now, um, folks who are entering the, the, the product category, um, in general, not just women and not just younger people, could be intimidated by Harley Davidson, right? I mean, they have this image and this name and you know all of that, and the bikes are big, they're heavy, they're big, and they're expensive. So these are all things that would um, like push away a new rider. So so how do we attract uh, new riders who may be women? very rapidly growing demographic and market segment, and just younger folks um, who might want to ride. Well, we have to have smaller bikes, we need more updated styles, and we need lower prices. All of these things, right? I mean, these are things that we, we would want to adopt. Now, it's not that younger folks don't like the concept of Harley And did I mention what year they started? I think 1903. Is that right? I think it's pretty much 1903. So let me just think about this a little bit. 1903, start making motorcycles. Um, okay, so let's say we add 20 or 30 years to that. 1933, 1943, I don't know. Oh, a whole new generation has passed. So in 1930s, they were sitting around in Milwaukee saying, oh man, you know, our riders are getting old. Who are we going to sell bikes to? Hey, why don't we sell to young people? 
It's in 1933. All right. All right, let's sell the young people. Let's find new young people to sell to. And then another 20 years pass, 1953, 1963. They're all sitting around the offices in Milwaukee saying, hey, you know what? Our customers who bought in the 30s are getting old. We need to find new people to sell product to. Hey, why don't we sell the young people? Okay, that's a strategy. Right, fast forward another 20 or 30 years. It's 1980s, 1990s. They're sitting around in Milwaukee. Hey, you know what? Our, our customers are aging out. We need to find, see this pattern? So, so this is not new. This is not something new they've experienced. This is something, this is kind of a cool story because we look at it through the lens of today. We're like, yeah, that is a decrepit, that, that brand is so old. Like, look at the people who buy those bikes. I'm like, ugh. You know, it's like evolved. And the rider has evolved and they've done that to some extent, but mm, they resisted a little bit. You know, one of the challenges is we define the brand sometimes as what we see. But let me also suggest that when we... Okay. Wow. Okay, I can't change the... Okay. Let me also suggest, though, that one of their brand images is being a rebel being carefree, being um, you know, the open road, being, you know, being anti-culture, being something that our parents aren't. Would, would you suggest that that's also an image they project? And let me just kind of tug on that a little bit and say, isn't that a, isn't that a kind of a, human trait that happens across all people. I mean, not everybody, but there are rebels at every age. There are rebels in every demographic. There are rebels in every gender identity. There's a rebels in, you know, it's a spirit. It's not a, like, category. It's, a, it's an innate, like, lifestyle or feature that people have. So they don't have to find young people. They just have to find rebels. They have to find people who want to strap on leather, ride a very loud motorcycle, and annoy others, right? That's who they need to find. It doesn't matter where they are geographically or what they are or anything like that, right? It's kind of like this market definition, this product market thing. If you find a product that transcends like that, then you've got your mind. I mean, you've got, you've got, You've got it made, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why they have, whether they've planned it or not, been, you know, a company for over 120 years. How many other companies have been around for 120 years that have 50% market share? Name them. I mean, how many, how many others are out there? Uh, not a lot. So if you think of DNA for business success, this is a pretty successful business, you know, however they chose to do it. All right, cool.